the cold open, the intro, the hook at the beginning of the video is like the most important thing. And so you kind of have to build um, your show somewhat around that. This is Podcast Perspectives, a show about the latest news in the podcast industry and the people behind it. I'm your host, Jeff Umbro, founder and CEO of The Podglomerate. Joining me today is a senior podcast growth marketer at HubSpot, Jonathan Barshop. He started his podcast career in the newsletter space with a small agency that he co-founded with a friend and has since taken over the audience growth initiatives at HubSpot for their podcast marketing division. HubSpot as a company sells CRMs and licenses to access those CRMs. So the HubSpot podcast network is actually unique because their mandate is to act as the top of the funnel to bring people into the HubSpot ecosystem, purchase licenses for their software. So on this episode, you'll hear about Jonathan's role at HubSpot and what the mandate of this podcast network is actually all about, what kinds of metrics and strategies Jonathan uses to grow a new show, and also what his perspective is on video podcasting in the year of our Lord 2023. Full disclosure, HubSpot is a former client of the Podglomerate, and Jonathan and I have worked together closely to launch a handful of shows. So let's get to the interview. So thank you for joining us, Jonathan. How are you? Good, good. Can you tell me and the listeners a little bit about like the HubSpot Podcast Network when you started versus where it is today? Yeah. So I think what HubSpot's thesis was or thesis is, is that, you know, they could keep renting land by buying ads on a bunch of different podcasts or trying to get placement on different newsletters and stuff like that. And they're like, why don't we just buy the land? Why don't we just own this? And so we can own the distribution. We can own kind of like the messaging behind it and all those things. And so that was kind of the impetus of the network. And kind of to your point, they, you know, they ha had this idea of building a network, but they were like, we kind of need a staple show and a staple, um, you know, newsletter and et cetera, et cetera, to kind of build off of. And that was where the hustle acquisition came in. Um, cause they had like basically from day one of the acquisition, a built-in audience, a built-in team of expert writers, a built-in team of expert marketers. And so they basically, you know, started on third base. And so they had kind of these two core pieces. And so there's like, let's build around it. And that's where you see them adding on shows like Entrepreneurs on Fire or Online Marketing Made Easy, um, just to kind of build out the rest of the network. They've also made a few other bets in terms of like betting on up and coming creators. So that's another part of the network is like the creator network, but just kind of trying to round up the whole network so that we have like A, hitting on a bunch of different topic areas, but B, um, also help like foster up and coming talent. How are how are you promoting HubSpot within this network? The the main driver is signups to the CRM because that's kind of like the gateway into all the other, you know, different products that we have. Um, so within every podcast episode, there's a HubSpot CRM ad. On the YouTube side, there's always a video ad of the CRM kind of playing at a certain point. And so that's sort of our lead driver. And then because we don't sell any ads within our network, we get hit up all the time of like, hey, can we get a placement on this show or what have you? And um, we do that for shows that aren't owned and operated within the HubSpot podcast network. So we leave those creators up to you know their own devices to fill those slots. But HubSpot's sole goal is to just drive CRM uh, signups and to promote other shows within the network so the pie grows and then ideally keep funneling those people into the CRM. So it's a top of funnel element to try and just bring people into signups for the CRM. And I imagine that uh, every signup makes you guys like, you know, a bunch of recurring revenue. Is that right? Yeah, that's the idea. Is it working? I mean, you guys have been, had this network now since 21 and presumably you keep doing it. So it's doing something right. Yeah, I mean, I am not paid enough to know <laughs> the exact <laughs> numbers on if it's working or not. I'm mostly gold on downloads for the network. Um, so in terms of growth, it's it's working. You know, it's a little bit harder in podcast land to actually attribute these downloads to then signups of the CRM. There's obviously tools out there that can help. But uh, clearly, we're, we're still growing the network and we're investing even heavier into you know video and all these other platforms. And so uh, there's no signs of slowing down. So I, I would assume it's it's working pretty well. Are you guys actually tracking like how many people are going from audio to the website? Like are you using pixel tracking or Spotify analytics or Chartable or anything for that? 
yeah, yeah, we're using, uh, you know, pod sites, um, I guess Spotify ad analytics, but you know, again, the data is not the clearest. So I think there's other sort of like secondary things that they're looking at too, which is thought leadership that, that they're developing, having an asset that they can then point to, whether it's, uh, for marketing purposes, sales purposes, that's kind of another aspect too. And then just sort of like the, the brand lift you get from having all these other shows kind of in your orbit, like again, the a- Amy Porter fields or Donald Miller's, um, there's just like a kind of brand halo effect that happens. That's not really possible to um, calculate, but you just kind of feel it, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it does. And I actually think that what you guys are doing with the creator partners uh, is is really fascinating. Could you give us like, you know, a minute on like what that actually is and where people can find more info if they're interested? It's kind of evolved over the last year, but initially it started out as like, apply for the network, we'll go through all the applications and then kind of whittle down the list and, you know, select some of our favorite candidates. Um, it, that's all dependent on a number of factors. It could be, you could be at literally haven't have launched a show, but if you're in the right category, like maybe we need to fill, um, we don't have enough like shows about product or product design it, within our scorecard that would maybe be marked higher. So there's certain elements that we would kind of factor in to uh, decide like which creators make it to the network, which don't. That's kind of evolved a little bit. Now it's more so us sourcing these creators. And again, they don't have to have a podcast, but if we find that they are, um, you know, maybe they're a big Twitter Twitter personality and they are talking about a specific niche that we like, or, you know, ideally they already have an established show and it's just kind of like that perfect fit for our network, we'll actively reach out, you know, go through the negotiation and then um, come to terms. I wanted to spend a few minutes kind of talking about podcast marketing 101 from your point of view. Because as mentioned before, like you really do have this unique take at, at growing shows. Everybody should check out Jonathan's Twitter account. It's at Barshop, B-A-R. It's a letter five instead of an S, H-O-P. You, you overshare like the uh, really like valuable nuggets of information. And I love it. Like I'll check it once a week just to see what you're up to. You can see how the HubSpot Podcast Network is operating with cross promos or putting their shows on YouTube or whatever. And he'll actually show like you guys, the data and the analytics and the charts. In any case, uh, how do you think about growing a show? Uh, I know that's a super broad question, but like, say someone comes to you, they have a show about product marketing. It's very niche. Uh, maybe they have a few hundred or a few thousand listeners. Like what is your first step there? Yeah, totally. It it is very dependent on the type of show, but if they are comfortable in front of the camera if they are willing to look at video as a huge investment and a very long-term, you know, bet, then I say go for it. Otherwise, I feel like sticking to audio and maybe just doing what we're doing right here where we have the video recorded, we can do minimal edits and throw it up on YouTube, like that's good enough. But being able to really invest in video is just like, it's a lot of money, it's a lot of energy, it's hard to find great people all those things. So I'm always very hesitant to tell people to go into video. So if you're sticking with just audio, um, I always tell people like, there's still no magic bullet. It's still the same tried and true stuff that's kind of always worked. So cross promotions is the best kind of like quote unquote free option because you're not having to buy anything on another show. You're just basically swapping with another show. Ideally, like where we see the best conversion there, and again, this is no surprise, is with shows that are familiar with your show or your host. Like one of the best promotions, cross promotions we did last year was with um, a personal finance show where the host like was a massive fan of My First Million and he just gave like the best ad reads. He basically said, if I were starting from zero and I had to figure out a way to build a business, I would go listen to My First Million. And we saw his fans flock over in droves. And so like, those are hard to come by obviously, but as much as you can, like try to figure out who those people are that, you know, are genuine fans of your work or who, you know, maybe you can start to build a longer term relationship with. And these don't have to be the Tim Ferriss's of the world. They don't have to be like the biggest names, find people who are adjacent in your category, build strong relationships with them. Same is true of like feed drops. Those actually, obviously like, I mean, you're having a person listen to a, basically a full episode of your show. So you'll see higher conversions there. Um, collaboration episodes is another kind of like spin on that where, you know, we did this with a show called Acquired. Um, you know, we interviewed them on our podcast and then 
they dropped that in their feed, but there's a lot of different ways to go about it. So those are all the kind of tried and true methods. For the paid side, it's like, it's bleak. <laughs> there's just very few options out there that are like cost effective and don't feel like you're getting fake downloads. Really what it comes down to is just like creating great content that's worth people sharing it and worth people talking about um, laced on top of like these other kind of cross promotional efforts. I want to actually go back to the the paid spend uh, aspect of what you just mentioned because one thing that I love and, and Jonathan and I worked together uh, you know a handful of times over the years and you have some of the best spreadsheets that I've ever seen uh, <laughs> where it's funny what I nerd out over now but uh, you are basically, uh, and, and we do this now as well, but like you basically pull all of the data from these different campaigns that you're running for paid, for cross promo, for anything else. And you pull as many data points as you can to see what's really like working effectively for you and to grow the shows. Um, so I was hoping that we could spend a minute just thinking through like, what are some of the data points that you would pay attention to with a cross promo or with a paid spend? That would make you say like this was valuable or this wasn't well actually i learned most of this from you so i feel like i'm kind of like teaching you what you taught me but yeah the main things i look at and this is all tracked and chartable um it, there's probably a few other services out there but we use chartable and the main things we look at are like top level you can see conversion rate so how many people heard that ad and then went and downloaded the episode uh, your your episode in your feed um then a layer below that, uh, and this is what Jordan Harbinger kind of exclusively tracks. He just tracks dollar per new converted device. So one of the other metrics in Chartable is number of converted devices. If you type in like uh, the amount you spent on that paid ad, or even if let's just say you were running a cross promo and there's no dollar amount tied to it, you can calculate what, what you would have spent for that cross promo and you can type that in and it'll shoot out a number of the dollars that it would have cost for or the dollars it costs to get that new listener over um, as a subscriber or as a downloader. So those are kind of like the two main metrics. And then there's a few other things you can also dig into, like the number of downloads and stuff like that. Those are all kind of like tertiary things that I'll look at. But yeah, the, the main kind of things are those two main ones. There's conversion rate and then dollar per new converted device. What What's a dollar per converted device that you guys would look at as like a success? And I know it'll vary based on the show, but very broadly speaking. Yeah, I, I mean, the general range I use is like anything above $10 is usually kind of in the red, like not a great buy. If it's well above like 15, 20 bucks, you'll see some that are like, you know, kind of crazy, like 50 to 100. Those are not great buys. So anything kind of in like the five to $10 range is pretty good. Anything below that is extraordinary. Historically speaking, from my point of view, like we'll always have one or two shows that will, uh, get like a, you know, under a dollar or something. Um, and then several shows that'll be right under 10 and then several where it just takes a little bit to find the right, you know, recipe. But oftentimes when it is a really low number, like there may be other factors contributing to why, um, or it could just be like that good of a show and that good of a market fit. But in any case, uh, there's a lot of really interesting things that people will look at in that regard. And and when you mentioned before that sometimes it looks like you're buying downloads, like I think what you may mean there is that sometimes you can buy a lot, uh, buy an ad spot that will drive a lot of impressions, but they may not be like the most retentive listeners. So what are you looking for in like a paid spend uh, in terms of tracking, like if people have stuck around as opposed to if they just show up and then disappear? Yeah, th this is like also kind of tough to track because you sort of have to do these tests in silos. Um, if I'm running like a cross promotion at the same time as I'm testing, you know, one of these podcast player buys or whatever, you, you have to do like a lift survey or a lift uh, analysis after the fact to be like, okay, we were at this baseline, we ran this test, and then after the fact, it was at this baseline now. That's like the easiest way to describe it, but it is like pretty messy because there's always so many things going on. It's easier to track for smaller shows just because you can pretty you can see pretty substantial bumps um, with those smaller shows. But when you're in the range of like upwards of like 20 to 50 to 100 to a million downloads a month, like there's just so many different factors at play that it's really tough to be able to track that. But the simplest way to describe it is like run a test with nothing else running at the same time if possible. 
and just see, okay, this is where we were at point A, where are we at at point B? Prime example of that, uh, we're running a paid campaign um, for this show. It's on one particular podcast app. This is a brand new show. We've never done any promotion for it outside of PR. Uh, so, and it's, you know, we're going to be able to see how many downloads we had on the app before this campaign and then after, and then we'll be able to see like a month from now, how many downloads we have from that app. So it will be a really good test to see like on a clean feed that is siloed, like how impactful different like marketing techniques are. Yeah. On that point, that is, you know, a lot easier to track when you're running a campaign on a specific, specific podcast player. You can see in the background, like, okay, this is how many downloads we were getting on that podcast player to begin. This is how many we're getting now. But those buys are few and far between. There's only so many podcast players that even had that inventory. And so, you know, going through these other plays basically to to grow your show, um, you kind of have to like triangulate a few different data points to try to figure out, okay, where were we before? Where are we now? 100%. And actually on that note, uh, one of the things that I was curious from your point of view is if I'm a new podcaster launching a show, uh, we we just went over a lot of like the organic growth methods that people can use. And just as a reminder, you know, feed drops, interviews, collaborations, cross promos. What would you suggest that I do if I said to you that I had a thousand dollars to spend versus ten thousand dollars to spend versus a hundred thousand dollars to spend? Okay, so if I was starting with like let's just say a thousand to five thousand bucks, I would, and this would be at the core of each of these. Uh, dollar amounts is a giveaway of some sorts. So I use a tool called Up Viral where I can make like a very clear um, landing page and flow to get people to take action. So, you know, the first page is sign up here. The next page is take these actions, you earn points. And whoever has the most points by the end of this um, walks away with like a pair of Apple headphones or whatever that incentive is that would get them to take that action. Usually Amazon gift cards and Apple you know, headphones or Apple products in general are pretty lucrative. So those tend to work pretty well with that. You'll get a lot of people who come in who are just there to like, you know, win the prize. And so you kind of have to sift through that, but you can get them to take actions beyond just like following on Apple and Spotify. You can get them to leave reviews. You can get them to share it with friends, all that stuff. It's not like as clean as it, I'm making it sound, but it's at least like pretty solid way to, you know, get people in the front door. And then on top of that, if I had extra budget, I would focus mostly on like feed drops, paid feed drops and paid um, host run ads on other shows um, that are in either like adjacent categories or have audiences that like could transition over to your show. That's literally the problem that we try and solve every day. And, and I know you're in the same boat. There's a million answers for that, many of which make sense and some of which don't. But, you know, you don't always know until after you've done it. But the giveaway idea is is a really interesting one and something that you guys do like better than anyone, I think. So everybody follow Jonathan for the next giveaway if you want your own set of AirPods. But the other thing that you all do at HubSpot that I think puts you a little bit ahead of the game is how you all are integrating with YouTube, which you know we all know is kind of a new idea in the podcasting space, old, very old to some, but generally like a new idea at the heart of it, people generally, historically anyway, have designed audio properties, which does not always translate in a clean or pretty way to YouTube for video. But like, if you had three suggestions for podcasters that are audio only who are moving, who are interested in moving to YouTube, what would they be? I think first of all, you really have to like break down the structure of your show. So Jay Klaus, he has a whole like post and video about this where he talks about how he totally regrets not starting with video first because he basically had to re-engineer his entire show to be video first. And the things he's mentioning in this video are basically like the cold open, the intro, the hook at the beginning of the video is like the most important thing. And so you kind of have to build um, your show somewhat around that. And with podcasting in general, um, specifically on like YouTube, um, you'll always see like a pretty massive drop off over those first few minutes. So that's just kind of like table stakes is make the interest make the opening like interesting um, and, and juicy so people stick around as long as possible. I think another thing that like Jay does really well and there's a few other shows that come to mind. I think my first million is actually like they they grow in spite of themselves. They are not great about this, but it's <laughs> making sure like you're outlining the episode super tight. Like 
one show that I'm keeping a pretty close eye on right now is called the Our Future Podcast. It's with guys who actually did clips for us for My First Million, like short form clips for us. Um, in the past, they were they their company was acquired by Morning Brew, and now they have a podcast. And what they do really well is you know they have their cold open, they have their hook to start, and you can tell like they are giving you just the right amount of content for that period of time, um, broken into like two very clean segments, and then they're out and. Throughout that, you can also tell that they're almost formatting certain segments within those segments to be uh, cut for short form. And what I mean by that is they start their episode with a cold open. They'll go into like the first topic, which is usually them breaking down like someone who's under the age of 25 who's crushing it in business. And then they'll do like a full breakdown of that person. And throughout that, they'll start that segment with like, okay, so this guy's 25, but no one knows who he is and he's making $6 million a year. Let me tell you the story. And you can tell they're formatting this for short form to be cut up versus just like if, if both of us were talking about it and we were just talking at a high level here, like we wouldn't really be thinking about it in that format. So they're like taking it so many different la layers. And I think that just makes it so much easier in the post-production process. It, it It's super, as, as a listener, it's like I'm just getting like the quick hits, the stuff that actually is important. And obviously like they're throwing in their banter here and there, but you can just tell like how much upfront work goes into the research, the the prep, the prep, the the way in which they like say certain things, um, and I think not enough people really focus on that. Obviously, it puts a lot more work on the front end, but it takes out so much work on the back end. Those are all really valid points, and I think it's funny that like I even think you saying what you just said underestimates the value that that will bring to people because so many people have thought so little about like video podcasting in the way that you have. So what kind of successes have you all seen? Like in the video space in particular, what makes you all happy? Like what metrics are you looking at? I mean, obviously there's like the vanity metrics, views, subscribers, um, follows, whatever platform you're on. But honestly, like I don't look at that too close. Yeah, it's great when we see a video like pop off on TikTok or shorts or whatever. Um, and you can see that in the backend data, it driving subscribers. But I'm always like, I'm always very hesitant to say that all these subscribers and all these followers that we're getting are great long form um, listeners or viewers. So it's like, you know, people are scrolling through TikTok or shorts. Like, are they really trying to then go listen to a full length episode? Like, I, I'm just thinking of my own patterns. There's been a handful of instances where I'm swiping through. I see a podcast clip and I'm like, oh, this is so juicy. I need to go listen to the full length episode. But those are like pretty few and far between. I know that now TikTok and YouTube are building functionality to where it'll be just like the click of a button. You see a clip from a podcast and then you can press a button and it'll take you to that full length episode. But get, but again, I'm very like mindful of the fact that people who are consuming short form, they're not just going to go jump to long form unless there's like something super compelling they need to listen to. So all that to say, like there's data that shows that these are driving a lot of views and subscribers and stuff like that. I'm not convinced that those are all like great, again, like long form listeners or viewers. But I think what it really is, and we're at the luxury of we have, you know, budget to kind of play around with. I think it's just brand awareness in general. Like the fact that Sam, Sean, um, the hosts of Marketing Against the Grain, all these folks are just on these different platforms and constantly like showing up at people's feeds. It, it might not be the first time that they see the video. It might not be the third time. And it might not be like the 18th time. But hopefully by like the 50th time, <laughs> you know, someone who sees like a short form piece of content, they'll be like, okay, like I'll go check it out. A lot of like, anecdotal um just man on the street type stuff i've heard is oh yeah we found you through like these different forms and i'm not able to like track the listener journey exactly but i have a feeling it's like it was just that it's like the 18th time that they saw us on tiktok that was finally what they needed to go listen to the show and then the most important part the show is so good that they couldn't leave you know it's like you have to have great content on the back end to keep people around anecdotally even i, I used to run a linkedin newsletter uh which by the time anyone is listening to this, like maybe I'm running one again, but like I can track six figures in business that came directly from that newsletter, even though to me as the writer, like it was rare that like I would ever hear that anybody was reading it at all. Like I'd get a few comments and emails like every week or two, but um, it was a little deflating because I'm just like, I'm doing all of this work and like not really seeing much. And you know, a year in, like I can directly tell you that, you know, four different clients found me through that newsletter um, and it was really gratifying, but took a while to really get there. And, and that is the thing that I noticed more than anything is that you get brands coming into the space on 
podcasting in general, but like specifically on YouTube or social. Um, and they don't put the time or the work into like really seeing the results. Anyway, Jonathan, thank you so much for the time today. Uh, we will have you back 100%. I think that there's, we just scratched the surface on what you and I can talk about, but um, really, really appreciate the time today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you again to Jonathan for joining us for this episode. You can find him on Twitter at Barshop with a five instead of an S. So B-A-R-5-H-O-P. Seriously, that's a real like suggestion to follow. He shares tons of info that I'm sure any listener to the show would find valuable. You can also check out hubspot.com slash podcast network or creators.hubspot.com to learn more about what we talked about in this episode. For more podcast related news, info and takes, you can follow me on Twitter at Jeff Umbro. Podcast Perspectives is a production of The Podglomerate. If you are looking for help producing, distributing, or monetizing your podcast, you can find us at thepodglomerate.com. Shoot us an email at listen at thepodglomerate.com or follow us on all social platforms at Podglomerate. This episode was produced by Chris Boniello and Henry Lavoie. And thank you to our marketing team, Joni Deutsch, Madison Richards, Morgan Swift, Annabella Panna, and Vanessa Ullman. And a special thank you to Dan Christo. Thanks for listening, and I will catch you next week.